You know, we, we talk a lot about the plan of salvation. And, and you know, people do the five-finger thing. You've got five steps here. First, you've got to have faith, and then you've got to confess, then you've got to repent, and then you've got to be baptized, and then you've got to live the life of a Christian. You know, letting God be boss and letting him change your life. And so then, then you have to have the scriptures that go along with that. And, and you know, almost everybody, uh, when they list scriptures for the plan of salvation, they take them out of the New Testament. Uh, we started off with, with uh, Acts 2.38, and, and, uh, and we, we talked Mark 16.16, 16 and, 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 and Matthew, the fifth chapter. Uh, you, you know, we, we got all these verses, and sometimes there's two for each one of the five steps. But I want you to take a look with me now in the book of Acts, uh, the 8th chapter. And let's see where the plan of salvation came from here. Beginning with the 26th verse, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit of said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and to sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his, its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, you know, out of all of the, the scriptures that people use for the plan of salvation, I have not ever talked to anybody who starts in the book of Isaiah to talk about the plan of salvation. But he started here in, in Isaiah, and he preached Jesus to him. You see, beginning in the book of Genesis, all the way through the Bible, uh, with, without a doubt, almost every book will point the direction to Jesus. It is, as the scripture says, that life began uh, separated from God. Because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were cast out of the garden and they were separated from that relationship to God. So then everything that takes place after that, and, and we see it even in the third chapter of Genesis, the, the 15th verse, where it, where it talks about enmity between the seed of evil and the seed of man, and, and how everything funnels down through prophecy and history to the point of Jesus Christ. And then everything from Jesus Christ flows out from him. He is the pivotal point of all of the Bible. From the book of Genesis through the book of Revelations, Jesus is the pivotal point. In the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 19, he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus didn't come to take the 613 laws that Moses brought down off of the mount uh, and put them away. He came to fulfill all of those things. Everything flows into him. And when he left his two commandments, you know, that we're to love God more than anything else, and we're to love others as we love ourselves, all of that is hinged up on the prophets, the law, and we will fulfill by nature the law that God left with Moses that he brought to the Israelites. We will fulfill by nature 
that law when we fulfill the law that Jesus Christ summarized for us in the love of God and the love of others. So everything points to Jesus. So it's, it's quite likely that you could take almost any book of the Old Testament and start there and preach Jesus. But I want you to notice what it says that he talked to him about. In the 37th verse, or 36th verse, excuse me. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, that's kind of funny, don't you think? You know, there's, there's lots of people that I have listened to on television that want to tell people that they, they, they want to tell people about Jesus and they want to tell G people about salvation and about that they can enter into that relationship. And what they say is that you need to say the sinner's prayer and then ask Jesus into your heart. You know, I, I really can't find that in Scripture anywhere where we're told to ask Jesus into our heart. I, I, I instead see here very plainly that he preached to him Jesus, and a part of preaching to him Jesus was how to be saved, the part that baptism plays in it. You'll notice when they came to the water, he didn't say, so what do I need to do to repent? You'll notice he didn't say, how do I, how do I give confession, which obviously had to have been a part of everything that he was talked to him about. Instead, he said, here is water what hinders me from being baptized. Uh, baptism, and this is a point that I refuse to argue about because I, I think the scriptures speak so plainly that it, in order to make it say something different, you've got to take the word that is here and change it altogether, and you can't do that. The word baptize means to dip, dunk, or plunge. Very simply, dip, dunk, or plunge. Beneath water. You know, so, so when you're talking about Jesus and the plan of salvation, even from the book of Isaiah, you get to the place of telling somebody about baptism. It's a necessary part of our salvation relationship to Jesus Christ. And people want to water it down. They want to say, oh, it's not at all that big a deal. It's not important. Well, I, I think that uh, the scripture says something different again. Third chapter of Matthew Beginning the, in the, the seventh verse, and it's talking about John, uh, Jesus' cousin. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers. Now, that's evangelistic, don't you think? Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And I believe we talked about that last week. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children uh, to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is a sermon in itself. Next verse, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. The difference between Jesus' baptism that he had here and the baptism would take place after the death of Jesus Christ was now that there was blood so that the covenant could be sealed. Prior to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, sins could not be taken away because there was no blood that had been shed. I indeed baptize you with water unto. It's going to happen in the future. Repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And therein lies another sermon. Uh, verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Another sermon. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? He understood who Jesus was. Verse 15, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, 
and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, I've had people tell me in times past, I don't need to be baptized. And I, and I, I say to them, there was only one person in all of human history that did not need to be baptized, and he was baptized. And they say, well, why did he do that? And verse 15 very clearly gives us his words when he said, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Why was he baptized? Because it was the right thing to do. That's it. You know, we, we don't need to argue about anything uh, as far as, as sprinkling or pouring. Uh, we just look at Jesus and see that his example was set for us in the very beginning. Let's just keep it simple. People need to be baptized like Jesus was baptized. Went down into the water. He was baptized because it was the right thing to do, not because he needed it. He didn't need to have his sins taken away. He had no sins. He did not need to receive the Holy Spirit. He was God. He did not need to be baptized, but he was baptized telling John that the reason that he was going to be baptized was because it was the right thing to do. Let's just leave it at that. You see, when it becomes that simple, there's nothing to argue about. The scripture speaks for itself. Well, let's go back again to the 8th chapter of Acts, and let's read verse 37 and following. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, and this is the confession of faith that we ask for at the end of the service, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him, dip, dunk, or plunge, put him beneath the water. Now when they had come, came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Why? Well, because he'd entered into salvation. You know, he was reading Isaiah, not understanding what it was all about. And Philip came and stood with him and told him about Jesus and how Isaiah was prophesying of Jesus and how, how Jesus died on the cross of Calvary so that people's sins could be taken away so that his spirit could come to dwell within them. He told him all of these things and the eunuch's answer was, here is water. What hinders me? What stops me from being baptized? Now, oftentimes we, we, we think that we need to go through a series of studies to get to this place. This was just the book of Isaiah and Philip was just preaching to him Jesus. And when he understood his relationship apart from God and how he could have that relationship to God, he said, I want to be baptized. Here is water. What stops me? But, you know, this is an interesting thing that uh, Philip says to him in verse 37. If you believe with all your heart. Well, what does that look like? Well, all of your heart means, you know, uh, pretty much... Uh, the entirety of your emotion, the entirety of your intellect, and the decision of your will. What to do with that? Well, it is to give your life to the Lord to let him be boss. You know, we have a hard, hard time with that in America because we're raised up in this society to be our own bosses. That we're, we're number one, that we've got to make decisions to take care of ourselves. We have a really hard time with this Lord business in our lives. We have a really hard time with bosses. You know, have you ever worked for somebody that you didn't respect? Wasn't that hard to work for them? And, and couldn't you find reasons to not work for them or not do what they instructed you to do because you did not respect them? Well, oftentimes what I have found in my life, when I didn't respect somebody, it was because they were reminding me of something in me I didn't respect. And so I focused on them. And I could give all of the disrespect that I felt for me to them. But this isn't the same case here, is it? We are raised in our society to not respect unless somebody deserves it. Well, if anybody in our lives deserves respect, it is Jesus Christ. It is God. And in our relationship to him, that would mean that there wouldn't be questions of our will, questions of our decisions, 
questions of our choices. There wouldn't be questions about our attitudes, our thoughts, our feelings, because God pretty well tells us what to think about, pretty well tells us how we ought to feel, pretty well tells us what we ought to be doing, what we ought to be saying, what we ought to be thinking, where we ought to be going, and why we ought to be there. So we have a hard time with this letting God be God. And he, he, he tells us to respect uh, authority, uh, to respect the rulers of our country, to pray for them, to submit and surrender. We, we have a hard time with those things. He tells husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life up for it. Husbands have a hard time sometimes loving their wives that way. Wives are to respect their husbands even as they do the Lord. Wives have a hard time doing that sometimes. Why do we have a hard time doing those things? It's not because we don't know. The reason why is because we haven't believed with all our heart. Verse 37, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He understood that when he was being baptized, he was committing his life to a new ruler in his life. His queen, Candace, was the authority in his life here upon this earth. But he understood that from this day forward that God, Jesus Christ, would be the Lord in his life and the boss of his life for the rest of his life. Sometimes we have not counted the cost of the life that we choose to give to God. But isn't that what he's talking about here? Believing with all your heart? You know, most of us don't have problems in our lives because we don't know better. We have problems in our lives because we don't really believe with all of our heart. Let's go to the book of Luke, the 8th chapter. Let's begin with verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a repeated phrase that goes all the way from the Gospels to clear to the book of Revelation. Verse 9, Then his disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? You know, and I, I put myself in their place. Yeah, that was a good story, uh, but, you know, what's the application here? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that, seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Again, a quote from the book of Isaiah. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And all of us are hearing and reading the Word of God today. The parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the Word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, I want you to notice all three of these instances that we're going to be talking about here have to do with thought patterns, and we, we talk extensively uh, late winter uh, of this year about how the evil one has access to our thoughts. And as he has access to our thoughts, it says here that he takes the word out of their hearts so that they can't believe it. Verse 13, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and this, this is coming back to that, Believe with all your heart, part, not just a, a little bit now and then, who believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. Well, where does temptation come from? Well, it comes from the evil one. The evil one knows what my temptations are. The evil one knows what your temptations are. So all he's got to do is provide the temptation, and you'll say, you know, I don't think I want to do this. Believe with all your heart. They didn't. 
Verse 14. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares. Riches, pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Where, where does all that stuff come from? Again, the evil one knows what it takes to get us defocused, to get us away from Jesus Christ and him being the Lord of our life. And he provides that stuff for us. All three of these instances have to do with the evil one's work in our life and how we succumb to it. Uh, verse 15, but the ones that, and, and by the way, believe with all your heart. What does that look like? Define it. Okay, let's do that. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. That's what believing with all your heart looks like. You see, it's coming to the place with this noble and good heart of saying, I know that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I also know that God loved me enough to provide a way for me to leave that behind and allow him to be a potter in my life to mold me and shape me and form me into what he wants me to be. And that's what I'm going to do. That's the good and the noble heart. And hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, is not just allowing it to be a part of us, but allowing it to change us, shape us, and make us into what God wants us to be. The word of God and the power of his Holy Spirit working in us, he is transforming us into vessels of honor to be images of him. That when people look at us, they see Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Ma Matthew said to us of what Jesus said? That we need to let our good works be seen by men so that they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. It is up to us then to allow the Lord to be Lord of our life, to take the knowledge that he has given to us in the word, to take all of that that is there and allow him by the power of his spirit to make it become living in us. You know, that we, we talk often uh, and there's the living Bible, uh, there's the living word of God uh, translation. They, they like the word living and, and we talk about living waters. Uh, and and the, this, the, the only way, you, you know, I don't know who made this, uh, it, doesn't matter it's in printed form uh, and you've got Zondervan and, and you've got all kinds of Bibles out there made by different printers um, and, and your Bible may be like mine you may have red letters for where Jesus was talking and black letters for where he wasn't uh, you, you know so we, we have been in the Word of God but the only way this becomes living is not by who published it but by those children of God who believe with all of their heart to allow this to become a part of their everyday life, and then the Word becomes living. It is just a book. You know, I, I, I had a little old lady in a church in Parachute, Colorado. And, and I, I took my Bible, and I was holding it something like this, and, and afterwards she chastised me severely. She, was, she always found something wrong. I, I, I was talking about the children in the church, and I called them kids. And she informed me that that was goats, that you didn't call children goats. And so I was holding my Bible like this one day, and she came up and she said that was blasphemy because I was mistreating the Word of God. This was something that was holy. That, that caused me to, some thought, so I went to, to think about it. This is not a holy book. This is a book. It only becomes holy when it lives in me. When it lives in you, if you believe with all your heart. I, I, I stand here firmly convinced before you to tell you this. We don't have problems in our lives because we don't know. We have problems in our lives because we don't believe with all our heart. Salvation started in the book of Isaiah. For the Ethiopian eunuch. 
Salvation continued in him because of his relationship to the Holy Spirit and to the Word of God. Where are you at in your walk with God? Pray with me, please. In humility, Lord, we bow before you to recognize that all of life comes from you and all of life goes to you. Uh, we also recognize, Lord, that you have, have a plan, a purpose for each and every one of us. And just like you, you told Philip to go and just like you, you took Philip away, uh, you have that for each one of us as well. A perfect will that can't be any better than the one that you've got. Our problem is submission and surrender. And, and sometimes we, we struggle with that. We, we know what we ought to do. We know what we ought to say. But we just can't bring ourselves to do it. God causes us to know that it's a lack of belief that's being displayed. Because if we believed with all of our heart, there wouldn't be any question as to what we would do, what we would say, where we would go, how we would think, or what we would feel. Lord, you are God. Thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen.